It is Friday, October 27th. Let's talk PlayStation. Welcome back, everyone, to another dramatic episode of LTPS. It's been uh, very much that. A lot going on this week, uh, especially relating to the PlayStation business, uh, more on the corporate side, which we'll you know talk about later. But uh, first, as always, a brief reminder for the PS Plus Essential lineup. So if you have not just yet, make sure you claim your October PS Plus Essential games. They're still live on PSN. And for our first story, let's talk about the new PS5 system software update, because this one uh, does more than just improve your overall system performance. There's uh, additional change log items on there. So uh, one being that the music in the control center is now much easier to use with a two column layout to browse categories, playlists, and songs. Um, and you can also uh, avoid unintentionally broadcasting your surroundings while streaming games with PSVR 2. That's a new setting under accessories, PSVR 2. Uh, and then uh, there's also a new voice command where you can ask what's new to check for new PS5 features, which that's in the change log, but that was already in the last firmware. I'm, I'm fairly certain. So that's not new, but it is somehow listed on here as a new thing that you can do. But either way, that's, uh, that's on there. And then uh, as always, they do say they've improved the messages and usability on some screens. So uh, we have seen in recent weeks, uh, it seems like every week there's at least one little minor change or update or feature. Uh, most of it has not needed a firmware update, but even in this case, it's, you know, either way it's fine, right? Um, just making little tweaks and improvements over time. So that's always welcomed. Now, moving on to our next news story, uh, PS5 game streaming for PS Plus Premium members, which went live in Japan recently, is now also available in Europe, which that means we can finally get a good idea of how many PS5 games are in total supported, uh, both inside and out of the PlayStation Plus game catalog, right? So uh, it sounds like the running count so far is about 220 games, uh, which is a, a fairly aggressive amount. And that's kind of what I was expecting looking at the Japan catalog, at least initially, uh, with every PS5 game that I did look at. It seemed like, you know, four out of five times, there was usually an option to stream that particular game, which made me think that perhaps we're looking at over 100 uh, or a few hundred games that are going to be available on day one. So that does seem to be the case because, again, it's a matter of being able to stream the games that are either in the catalog or outside of it, but you happen to own the digital version of that game. So, uh, yeah, 220 is a lot of titles. <laughs> That's actually pretty aggressive for uh, their sort of initial debut of PS5 game streaming. Um, and kind of dialing back to the last news story, they did make a minor change here, which is uh, on your main home screen when you're looking at your games, um, if a PS5 title does have a streaming option available, there's now a very tiny little cloud icon that would be next to the area where there's usually other icons denoting if it's a disc title or a PS Plus game or this and that. Now there's a little cloud icon as well. Uh, telling you that it is a PS Plus streaming game. So just a, a small little change there, but again, we're just seeing Sony tweak things left and right for uh, very minor, but I would say solid quality of life improvements. All right, let's move on to some Spider-Man 2 news, starting off with what I think was kind of expected, or at least there was a very good chance this would happen, which is Spider-Man 2 is now officially the fastest selling PlayStation Studios game in PlayStation history, selling 2.5 million copies in 24 hours, which is uh, a phenomenal achievement. And just for comparison's sake, we had God of War Ragnarok sell, uh, that was 5.1 million in one week. And normally, you know, Sony's a little bit weird with how they dictate this stuff, right? So sometimes when they share these uh, huge sales milestones, they've done it before where it was like, oh, the first 24 hours, the first three days, the first week. So they always kind of pick the, the number and the sales milestone that I think fits for that particular game. Uh, so in this case, in the first 24 hours, it's somewhat undeniable for Sony to be able to put out there that, hey, in, in 24 hours, this is how many we sold, which is an incredible amount um, and really shows that, yeah, this game was going to do... <laughs> <laughs> this game was going to move units. Uh, and so based on the 5.1 from Ragnarok, I would be curious to see what this game will end up doing by one week, which, you know, would be right about now. So <laughs> that means uh, maybe Sony will share another update. I don't know. It's something where they don't typically do that. They'll share one sales milestone, then we don't get more of them until it hits like 10 something million or something like that, right? Or if it's in a fiscal report. But uh, either way, I'm sure Insomniac and PlayStation are uh, quite happy with that number. Now, naturally, I think this was also kind of expected, which is, you know, a big AAA game coming out. 
we're going to see problems day one, week one. It's a matter of how widespread or how big are the issues. And so uh, for Spider-Man 2, there were a few pain points recently. Uh, number one, which was, it seemed like a, a genuine mistake on whoever did this at Insomniac's part, but it's a matter of how in-game some of the flags being displayed in Miles Morales' home and also in the neighboring areas and the, that street, um, there's Cuban flags instead of Puerto Rico because that's, you know, Miles is Puerto Rican. So that was, uh, it, it seems like that could be a very easy, honest mistake, even though it, it seems like a big oversight that could have easily been caught by somebody on the team that maybe uh, it would have been natural for them to see that because that's something where I think for many folks, you could easily just kind of walk past that and not realize it right due to the similarities of how the flags look. Uh, but Insomniac did apologize and they um, already sent out a patch one point. 1.3 that not only fix that but also a few other items in there as well uh, and that kind of goes into the broader you know issues that people are running into so some glitches here and there some bugs right um, again something where we don't know how widespread it is but you know due to the the, the sheer sales volume of the game that's why we're going to see a lot of this stuff i think um, so it was kind of expected um, now what was maybe more unforeseen is that there was a, a subreddit thread on um the uh, Spider-Man PS5 subreddit. And there was about 300 comments on there uh, reporting problems with installing the disc. Uh, it would stop at 36%. Some folks can cannot get past it, uh, whether they try and copy directly from disk by making sure you're offline, doing a database rebuild, things like that. Um, it, it seems like the disks, uh, there might be a, a small batch that were, you know, just bad. I've had one copy of a, well, this happened to Stray PS5 from im 8 bit which I did get a bad copy of that game, and it would not copy from disk. Um, so these things do happen, right? But it's a matter of we don't know how how big of an issue it is, right? So uh, it's it's hard to say. Obviously, if you're, you're spending 70 bucks on Spider-Man 2, bringing it home, uh, and you're excited to play it, you're gonna you know yell about it online, right? So um, right now, Sony and Insomniac have not said anything. We'll see if they do provide some kind of update. Uh, surely they're looking into it, but uh, definitely bad news <laughs> with all the physical game stuff we've had recently. Uh, the last thing we need is to have people you know put off from physical media, at least in the game space, but. Uh, that is what happened this week for Spider-Man 2. Moving on to our next news story, the Metal Gear Solid Master Collection Volume 1 is finally available. And this too is something where I think many people walked into this full well knowing that these were not going to be good ports of these games. And so there's a number of issues across all of them, which Konami are saying they are going to address them via a patch. Begs the question, why not do that before the games are available? But, you know, that's neither here nor there. The more intriguing news, however, is that uh, we have more evidence of MGS4 possibly being included in Volume 2, which we assume is coming considering they called this Volume 1. So uh, the one Reddit user, Tim0653, discovered the evidence where they are seeing what could be included in all of Volume 2. So when they were looking at the scripts for the collection launcher of MGS2, they found strings related to Peace Walker, MGS4 and MGS5, which not the first time we've heard those three games for what we again assume is going to be in volume two. And the, um, you know, the real surprise in there is MGS4, of course, because we're, we're still not sure, you know, <laughs> how they're going to approach that, right? The game heavily leans on PlayStation 3 hardware with the cell broadband engine. Uh, and so emulating it is uh, a bit demanding. And so, you know, it's, it's a matter of, are they really going to recompile and properly port the game? Uh, apparently, well, not apparently, we know that Konami had, you know, running Xbox 360 code of the game and that it was fully playable and that was a good build at the time, but who knows if they still have that or, you know, what, whatever the case is, if they want to pursue it that way. It, it really is a question of, are we really going to get MGS4 unshackled from the PlayStation 3? And having Peace Walker brought forward on modern platforms as well would be welcomed, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, for now, that's, um, I guess it, it would be encouraging news if not for the fact that this is Konami we're dealing with, and we can already see how they're uh, fumbling Volume 1, so don't exactly have high hopes, but you never know. I, I just, I want to see what they're going to do with MGS4. That is the odd man out. Next up, for the new PS5 model, we have real-life photos of the product box uh, compared to the existing one, which, uh, you know, the console is finally showing up at retailers, so we are fairly confident in saying that uh, the street date for this thing is November 10th. That's at least for the MW3 bundle, and then the Spider-Man one is apparently two days earlier, uh, but it's showing up at retailers, so it should be, uh, you know, available soon. But 
we can see a comparison shot from the existing box with the new one and that's where just off the product box it is indeed I would say substantially smaller because the the thing is the PlayStation 5 product box as many of you know is gigantic <laughs> it's it's huge the console itself obviously is huge right so the box by association is going is going to be very big but you know for for the longest time like you know original PS3 boxes were one of the biggest ones out there and the PS5 one dwarfs that. <laughs> so um, it's one of the early indicators that, you know, kind of going back to that one LTPS, I think many people are gonna be surprised by how much smaller this is. It'll still be, it, it's still gonna be a, a decent footprint for where you have to store it and, you know, keep it, but it's still gonna be, a, I think, a good chunk smaller than the, the console that we have nowadays. But yeah, that should be available on November 10th or 8th. Now, because we have real photos of the new PS5 product box, that also means we learned something about it that is not great news, but there is a reason for it, which is on the bottom of the box in very tiny letters, little asterisks there, it says, internet connection required to pair disk drive and PS5 console upon setup. So that means it's a one-time check-in, after which it should be playable offline. But the concern here, of course, is a long-term preservation perspective. You know, we're talking 20, 25 years later, so obviously it's not a problem now. But um, at a certain point when it comes to aftermarket consoles getting shared around and, you know, needing donor parts and things like that, it would have been great to have, you know, the disk drive easily swappable, and that way you can keep all these consoles going. But if there's no server to authenticate those drives to new consoles, then you've got a bunch of e-waste. So that's the problem. So I saw this news and, you know, disappointed. I'm like, really, what a misfire? How, you know, why, why are they doing this? But then I'm like, oh, wait a minute though. I, I think the mindset changes a bit here because, you know, we've never had the like a console that easily lets you do this in terms of it being so modular with taking it off and popping it into a, uh, popping it into a new console. But this is still a problem today based on uh, DMCA laws. That's why uh, most Blu-ray devices, as far as I know, and uh, at least in particular for PlayStation consoles, this is very much the case where if you're servicing those Blu-ray drives, you cannot just swap those across consoles. You can't do it. They're not plug and play because um, they're married to the, there's a, a daughter board on every Blu-ray drive and that's usually almost always on a software level married to the motherboard so if you want to swap around you know blu-ray drives on ps3 4 and 5 you know it's it's something where you have to take the 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 daughter board and then try and fix whatever other part is not working if your daughter board doesn't work then you're kind of screwed obviously um but that's been the case like for not just playstation but really all these these blu-ray devices right so it's that's why like the rule doesn't change even though the drive is user replaceable and swappable so it's it's really sony being compliant with a, a law here to protect from you know copyrighted material being modified or, or pirated things like that right and obviously it's also that knock-on benefit of sony being able to protect genuine sony parts right so you can't just throw on an aftermarket one but um at least in the case of like older playstations i know you can i mean custom firmware can usually get around it so i'm sure there's a path you know down the road we can explore and realistically in terms of e-waste and preservation ps5s already have a problem with the ssd being soldered onto the uh, motherboard so i mean there's there's that that's looming but still i would have liked to see sony try and do something here that would be compliant with the law i'm not sure what they could have done because uh, in theory at least the first time people buy these consoles it would have been great to have them ready immediately. So, but in terms of the manufacturing process, I don't think, I'm not sure if it means they, they can't do a period or it's it's not financially viable to, you know, sort of complicate the, the process by making sure that these, you know, 80% of consoles go off to make sure that they get the handshake done before they're sold. You know what I mean? So it's like, that could be an issue. Um, I'm not sure if it's something where they could still be compliant by shipping you know, game discs that have the, the sort of handshake needed to authenticate the drive, which is something they do for firmware updates. They've done that since the PS3 and PSP days where game discs uh, carry firmware updates. So you can still keep your consoles updated completely offline. I believe they still do that for PS5. So, you know, that was my initial thinking, like maybe they could do that, but I, I don't think that's compliant with the law. So that's the real problem here is, is that they can't even do like a firmware update down the road unless the law changes. So it sucks, but uh, yeah, initially I was like, ah, oh, that's such a bummer, but there, there's a reason for it. It's not just Sony's fault. Um, 
and obviously I, I like to keep keep tabs on the whole preservation scene and it's a topic I'm passionate about so saw this news and I thought that was certainly worth pointing out and also explaining why that is why it is the way it is moving on to some PlayStation business news and what a timely situation going on here where we've got Eric Lempel, the SVP and head of global marketing, sales, uh, head of business operations. He's got quite the title. Uh, would be a lot easier if he did become president and CEO. Uh, but he was doing a press junket recently, which he's done before. But it, it just this caught me off guard. I'm like, all right, he might be lined up to be uh, president and CEO. But I digress. The point is, he was recently doing a press junket, speaking with a few different sites and uh, talking about the PlayStation business. And so, uh, speaking with Baron, he uh, did acknowledge and discuss the PS Plus price increase issue, where uh, he said, and I quote here, we want to make PlayStation Plus great. With our reboot last year and introducing the tier system, a lot of consumers have recognized that there's a lot of value in PlayStation 5. Like practically everything else in the world, we have to look at our pricing and we have to adjust to market conditions. I'm happy to say, unlike a lot of other subscription services out there, we haven't touched the PlayStation Plus pricing for 85% of the world in many years. So this was the first time we did something there. So there you have it. That is the company's response to the PS Plus price increase, which is a whatever answer, right? It kind of goes back to what we said before where everything's going up in price. So cost of goods are higher, the value of the dollar is weaker, and you know, a big business like Sony, it's about not only keeping those margins, but you know, a good, this is a good opportune time to probably squeeze in more. So uh, the price increase is a steep one. Uh, nobody likes it, but that's just kind of what, what happened, obviously. So uh, yeah, kind of a, Kind of an honest answer, but still trying to put a positive spin on it, right? Or make it seem like it's not nearly as bad as, uh, you know, it, it seems. But uh, Eric also touched on in the same interview, uh, the, you know, Sony's position in the VR business, you know, PlayStation VR 2, how it's doing. And so uh, he gave broad answers on how they still want to be in the space. And, you know, they're, they're happy to be in it because it helps them with innovation. So he says, and I quote, it's never going to be the only way people play games, but I'm happy that we're in it. There are great experiences to be had and consumers really like it, but it's a nascent business for us. So that is, uh, I think, more of an honest answer in that, you know, they're not trying to, you know, shout from the rooftops that, you know, they're, the, the VR is going to be the next big thing or something like that, right? I think they're, you know, finally starting to change the language surrounding VR to the point where it's very much, hey, we're happy to do this and we want to be well positioned. Uh, but it, this is not exactly a large segment of our business, as we saw from the... Uh, that one fiscal report where they did tell us some PSVR 2 numbers, but uh, it very clearly showed that launch aligned with PSVR back in 2016, it seems like it's gonna, you know, collide and not really keep up with that sales pace, which you know, that's it's disappointing because I will still always vouch for PSVR 2 and VR in general. I, I love playing it. I've been playing mine more recently, actually, which is which has been super fun, and it's it's I always love it, man. It's it's great, but it's yeah, it's Eric is right. It's not the only way to play games. It's just a shame that VR has been getting such a bad rap and PSVR 2 in particular because there's still like so much stuff coming out for it, right? I've got so many games loaded up that I have not gotten to just yet. So a bit of a shame there, but um, at least he's, uh, you know, provided some words there. Now, he also touched on uh, this holiday season, and this was an answer he gave with Barron and also Yahoo Finance. So he spoke with, uh, with them about this, but it's a matter of this upcoming holiday season, very bullish on PlayStation 5 sales, more or less saying that the last three years we were a bit supply constrained. Last year obviously was substantially better than 2020 and 2021, but uh, he's saying this year they should be able to fulfill demand and uh, it's, it seems more and more clear that they're going to be hitting their very aggressive price targets, um, as he discussed in these interviews. So uh, this holiday season, if you're looking to buy a PlayStation 5, maybe you really won't have to sweat it because they've got a lot of these things ready to go, which a lot of them are going to be those uh, new models. Now, again, I just want to point out, I find it very peculiar that he's doing these interviews. He has done them before. He's been a public-facing entity for the company, but it's not often. We, we don't see Eric that often. Um, so, I mean, either either he is lined up to be the next president and CEO, or, you know, he's at least the interim guy doing the public-facing talk while Jim Ryan is, you know, uh, getting ready to not do that stuff anymore. In fact, I, I would venture a guess and say we're, we're not going to see him anymore. Like, that was it, right? The announcement, the retirement, and he his, like, public-facing duties are over. 
um, unless something has to come up with fiscal reports or something. But I, I don't think that's the case uh, for anything scheduled. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, I still think it's him, but you never know. Now let's move on to the former chairman of Worldwide Studios, Sean Layden, where he was speaking with the Lawn Party podcast. And again, sort of doubling down on his previous comments about uh, game development and its rising costs and also consolidation. So uh, Sean was quoted saying, I'm just concerned about what it does to the creativity urge inside of studios. And can they keep that sort of independent creativity alive or do they just get absorbed into the larger whole? Time will tell, but it's a bit concerning. When you go from hundreds of voices to dozens of voices, you lose some voices. And Sean does also uh, admit that there is upside to consolidation in certain circumstances for smaller studios. It really, it primarily hinges on can they keep their creativity. Now, on the topic of preservation, Sean also shared some choice words, saying, and I quote here, preservation is important. I'm hoping that more people in the industry, certainly the big players, begin to realize that there's an obligation and responsibility. This isn't throwaway stuff we're making. This is stuff that should be around for a long time because future generations will enjoy it in the same way that we have, and it's criminal that we're not doing more to protect it. I agree, Sean. I agree. It goes right back to that Video Game History Foundation survey where they found, unsurprisingly, that the vast majority of games are commercially unavailable today. So if you want to play older stuff, then chances are you'll need to maintain old consoles and uh, original copies to play that stuff. Uh, but it goes much further than that, right? It's, uh, again, online check-ins, which uh, we need to be less reliant on. And it's also at a studio level, you know, per developer, per studio, per publisher, they should all be doing archiving efforts internally when it comes to, you know, preserving the tools that made those games, preserving the source code, multiple builds, so that if they need to go back and do something or if they want to port, remaster, make it much easier and conducive to doing that stuff in the future, right? You have to be doing it now. You have to preserve the tools and what you do to make those games right now, which um, it is my understanding that a lot of studios are finally doing this, but for many, it's a matter of like, well, we got to pay people to do that. And it's it's a, a financial undertaking that many just don't want to do. So it sucks, but uh, you know, it's, it's great hearing Sean sort of preach this stuff and uh, be an advocate for it. And uh, unsurprising to hear him still talk about the the rising cost of game dev. And, you know, he's, again, been really uh, vocal about the consolidation of this industry where it could go south. And a, I, I'm always of the mind where it's not complete doom and gloom, but I would absolutely prefer if we had a lot of big names that can sustain themselves and they don't have to be absorbed by larger conglomerates. All right, let's get into the big... Uh, drama, controversy. I kind of don't like using those words, but that's initially how this played out, right? Because uh, essentially what happened here is that to explain the entire timeline, we had uh, David Jaffe, the co-creator of the Twisted Metal series and also the game director for the original 2005 God of War. Um, he was mentioning on his personal YouTube channel that uh, there was there was bad news coming for PlayStation. And then hours later, he finally verified it with more people that he knows. And he said it was about Connie Booth getting fired from PlayStation. Now, Connie Booth was the SVP and head of internal production, but she's been with PlayStation since the very beginning. She's got a 30 year tenure with the uh, with the company. And, you know, it's something where I think this week, a lot of people learned who Connie Booth was. And uh, I, this was a name I brought up a few weeks ago for when Jim Ryan announced his retirement, it was one of the following LTPSs from that week. But, um, you know, I was making the case for Eric Lempel that oh, I think it's Eric Lempel. It could be Lin Tao. And I was like, oh, there's probably other people towards the bottom. that are going to get moved around a bit, you know, and I had mentioned Connie Booth, Connie Booth, Scott Rohde. You know, these are names that are going to get shuffled around as you would presume they're going to do this all internally, right? Sony doesn't normally bring in outside folks uh, for those positions. So they, they tend to restructure and uh, somebody will get moved up. And therefore some lower folks might also get moved around as well. I said Connie Booth at the time, but Clearly, this is a, uh, well, that was not going to happen because it is confirmed via Axios from an SIE employee that, uh, yeah, she's gone, but they gave a very short boilerplate answer that she did leave, but she helped drive success to the business and, and this and that. You know, they didn't talk about, you know, why she left or how, but um, 
It's from Jaffe's accounts across two different uploads that he had heard, which is really important to understand. It's hearsay. And a lot of this is him speculating too, but what he had heard from what he says is two people within Sony, two people outside of it, is that Connie was fired and that her team is also gone. The running theory that Jaffe has, and again, this is based on accounts of what he's heard, is that perhaps Connie was somehow being blamed for The Last of Us multiplayer's cancellation, and that a lot of the studios internally are unhappy with the games as a service pivot. Then Angie Smets, uh, who she was from uh, Guerrilla Games, and she recently joined PlayStation's corporate side earlier this year as the head of product development um, or strategy development, something like that. She's apparently assuming Connie's role and uh, her responsibilities as well. So again, based on Jaffe's speculation, it might have been Herman Hulst, also from Guerrilla, obviously, who wants more of his team on the staff, right? So that's kind of how this played out. Um, and depending on how you view David Jaffe, some people think he's, you know, just stirring the pot and making drama and this and that, uh, or some see this as a big loss for PlayStation. Now, I was well aware of Connie Booth because she is a very big name in this uh, for this company, right? So I would say, yeah, it's a significant loss. She has her name attached to so many well-known uh, products throughout PlayStation history. She was very good at her job, and so to see her get fired is uh, surprising, assuming that is what happened. You know, the company is not going to say that unless there was some sort of, a, you know, perhaps public spat or something, right? Um, but internally, we don't know what the circumstances were, right? Obviously, Jaffe is speculating, but he's framing it in a, a very bad way, which uh, very much, I, I think, validates the opinions that many have about the PlayStation business nowadays, which is the games as a service pivot. So it really depends on how you view these things. Um, you know, for me personally, I always find that with any organization, there's going to be some friction with the direction of where the company is going. So I have no doubt in my, in my mind that there are some people at the studios that perhaps don't want to, you know, work on live service stuff, but that is going to be highly dependent on who and what team they're on, right? Because as we've said time and time again, this company is not doing less single player games. They're doing not only more of those uh, based on what's in development and how much they're investing, but that's also including the live service stuff, which has been missing within their portfolio. And a large portion of those um, of those games are coming from new studios, right? Fire Sprite, which was recently acquired. Um, Haven, which was recently formed, right? So it's not even a matter of like all these existing single player studios are all doing multiplayer projects. There's still so much unknown about where the, the company is going with, well, it's not exactly unknown. We know where they're going, but it's a matter of the end result and if it's going to play out for them. If this is going to be a bet that, you know, Jim Ryan was really, um, you know, trying to move within the organization and if it's going to pay off in the end. And the thing is with Jaffe too, I know some don't like him, but he's just speculating. He always tries to uh, let people know that it, it's him speculating, and this is what he's heard. Uh, this is what he's heard. This and that. Excuse me. So it's not like he doesn't know people at PlayStation, right? I think that, that's silly to, to sort of make the accusation that he wouldn't know about these things or he wouldn't be hearing about them. Uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff where you know it's you're, you're going to hear it by these accounts, right? You're not going to have Sony come out and confirm it and talk about why and this and that. So uh, you know. If that is the case, it's surprising. I, I would be curious as to if that really is what played out because for her tenure at the company, it's surprising. She delivered for 30 years. So um, best wishes to Connie. Uh, again, we don't know what happened there, but uh, she is uh, a valuable asset to any company. And maybe we'll one day get a, a better picture of what exactly has been going on during the PlayStation 5 cycle. Now, with all that said, it is time for Let's Talk Plus, the weekly Let's Talk PlayStation giveaway where one of you can win a $10 PSN code. So we'll try Linktree for the first time. Follow the link down below. Then Linktree will have the Gleam giveaway. I already don't like how I have to announce this because it doesn't really roll off the tongue. Uh, so we'll do that as kind of a pilot program. If we have problems with Gleam from Linktree or if there's low, uh, low submissions, then we'll probably just have to close it because it's just, you know, it already had a low entry number every week anyway in relation to total views. You always had a good chance of winning $10, but um, we'll try it that way. Those are all the news stories from this past week that I wanted to talk about with you all. And our Tuesday video was, I recently went to a Retro Game Con in Syracuse and as a really dumb, silly idea, I wanted to vlog it using a PSP camera. 
Never really did one of those retro uh, convention vlogs that uh, I love watching from other folks that do do it. And I thought, why not do that on a PSP? So you can go check out that weird, what feels like a time capsule, honestly. I kind of love how that turned out, but you can go check that out. And uh, that is it. So that concludes this week's episode of Let's Talk PlayStation. I'm Ryan Panecki. Thank you all so much for talking with me. And I will see you all next Friday. Thank you.